All right, so uh, hello, and welcome to the Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero show, where we apply the philosophy of Ayn Rand to thrive in our daily lives and create a life and lifestyle with the qualities of an Ayn Rand hero. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Michael Lewis, a.k.a. the Profitability Coach, helping you earn an increasingly beautiful return on consciousness. (laughs) <laughs> where the life that you inherit tomorrow is better than the one you woke up with today, but only forever. Uh, this episode of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero is part of the integral Rand.com series, where we examine Ayn Rand's philosophy specifically in the context of Ken Wilber's integral theory. And uh, our guest today is Michael Grady, who, interestingly enough, I met through a Facebook conversation. We were talking about various things and Ayn Rand and Ken Wilber came up and he said, hey, do you look at Ayn Rand through Ken Wilber's theory? And I said, yes, and let's have a conversation and see where it goes. And that is the context for this call. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce Michael Grady and we'll just see where it goes. Hello, Michael. Greetings. Uh, good to be here and looking forward to some um, edification on the whole matter <laughs> and hopefully I can bring something to the table with this too. It is my guess that you can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so So um, uh, real quick I've been studying Ayn Rand and Ken Wilber pretty diligently for <clears throat> 25 years about. Just about the same amount of time. Um, my priest actually turned me on to Ken Wilber. How cool is that? Right. Um, what is your kind of background with Ken Wilber, Ayn Rand, have you read her books, how long ago, kind of so I can get a sense for what our common vocabulary is and where, what our kind of starting point for common ground is. Sure, uh, Ken Wilber introduced to him about 25 years ago um, by my original uh, scholar mentor, uh, Buddhist scholar mentor, uh, Jim Royster. And he, that was the first tome that I wrote or read by Wilbur. Um, and which just, which one? Uh, Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality. And, <laughs> Start with the big one. Yeah, because I was studying religions and psychology and philosophy at the time, and it just really, at the time, he wasn't using that ang- language, but integrated all the world thought for me at the time. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, was my introduction to Wilbur, and I'm currently an integralist. I just follow him as best as I can. Uh, Anne Rand I read probably about 20 years ago, um, and it was Atlas Shrugged. I led, read some kind of commentaries on her work, and my initial hit with her was, wow, I really understand the society I live in as far as capitalism goes, self-reliance, and where that's coming from. And I felt a really strong kind of motivational empowerment from it. And then something fell flat for me about just what I saw unfolding is there were the haves and have-nots, and that was acceptable. There were the masters of the universe and then the parasites, and I found that unacceptable. And so I just, I'm a deconstructionist at heart, so I deconstructed her and said, no good. Mm -hmm. Um, So as an integralist now that I want to be more fully, is I'm saying, how do I integrate what's good, what's valuable in her teachings with my worldview? Does that answer your question for you? Um, yeah, I, um, it it sets a context, and we'll just explore the context sure. and see where it leads. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, in in our literally one or two line email exchange or message exchange on Facebook, yeah. you said something along along the lines of. I, I think of Ayn Rand and orange in spiral dynamics or amber in integral theory. Did, right. Did I, am I remembering that accurately? He, uh, I, I didn't mention spiral, but definitely orange in the stage um, structure of mm-hmm. you know, success, ambition, 
self-reliance, winners and losers. Mm -hmm. That's how I kind of view her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, so in spiral dynamics or integral ele elevation, there's this level orange or amber where it's about, I mean, I mean not amber, orange. Um, it's about um, the level of self, the value, right? Where does your value center comes from? It comes from, you could say, the self and rationality and the mind and what you're accomplishing. Right. If if the previous level of blue or amber is um, the group and being part of an ethnocentric group or religion of or uh, a group philosophy, the orange is about individualism. It's about recognizing that rationality on its own gives you insight and that your own mind is the source of values or uh, compared to blue or amber, it's a source of values. Right. And another way of putting that is that it is the rational stage. It's where rationality comes into its own. Science, the enlightenment, and the value of rationality beyond the premises of a revealed religion. Does that match your experience of this level? Ab yes, absolutely. And, and just it, it, you may be leading to this, but also uh, the kind of emphasis on a kind of um, individualism, a uh, strong sense of individualism, self-reliance. And just to add to the conversation, we may get to this, I've always been kind of obsessed with what's selflessness, mm -hmm. where she's really promoting the almost the deification of the self, the individual, is the is what you're shooting for in life. That's the highest goal. Mm -hmm. Am I way off track for you? Okay, so there, there's a couple there's a couple parts of it. It typically Ayn Rand is put on the orange level, right? She's the individual level. She is in in many senses a paragon of that level. She champions rationality, individualism, the mind, uh, each individual being the source of the validation of concepts, the validation of ideas. And so if we say that Ayn Rand is that piece, then we have to ask what does individualism mean? What does independence mean in the context of uh, both the orange level and you could say Ayn Rand's ideas in particular who um, if you limit her to orange right, if you say okay Ayn Rand can only be orange then um, I think it's a misreading of her but I think it's also completely fair to say that she is the paragon representative of orange her work in orange I think is essential beautiful valuable and you, in terms of finding her value, in terms of including her and integrating her into an integral framework, if you think about Ayn Rand as healthy orange or fully developed orange, where she actually goes through and gets orange solid, then I think that's a really useful way to understand her. She's not... Uh, She's, her insights about blue or amber are really about coming out of it. So it's, it's a counter-fixing classic developmental scheme where you transcend and then differentiate from the past. So her ideas about blue are very much about differentiating and finding its faults. Right? Where uh, you could say similarly, her ideas about green are very much that she uh, does the pre-trans fallacy where she sees all green as blue, <laughs> right? She sees wow. everything, everything that's beyond orange as a regression down into pre-rational, uh -huh. right? right. In, in terms of the pre-trans fallacy, you're familiar with the pre-trans fallacy, yes? The, uh, I, I, yes, I've, and, but give me a quick 
executive nugget of it again. Great, great, and and specifically in the context of this discussion. Yeah. So the pretrans fallacy says that uh, there are uh, rational thinkers. For example, scientists. Uh, Ken Wilber uses the example of Freud. Mm -hmm. And Freud recognizes rational thinking and says, okay, there's rationality and irrationality. That's the binary. Mm -hmm. Right? You're either rational or you're irrational. Right. Right? And so uh, uh, Freud and Ayn Rand says, okay, anything that isn't glorifying rationality, that isn't based on rationality, that claims anything beyond rationality, anything other than rationality, becomes irrational in her perspective. Digressive. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. 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 Now, the opposite, the opposite example of that is uh, Ken Wilber describes Carl Jung, right? Whereas Freud says that anything other than rationality is unconscious, pre-rationality, irrationality, including all of religion. Right? All of religion is just the projection of our childish fantasies out onto the universe. Right. Right? Okay. Uh, the other side of the pre-trans fallacy is uh, Jung, who says that any, there's, again, rational versus non-rational. And anything non-rational is spiritual. Who says this? Uh, Carl Jung. It's a, it's an oversimplification, but in order to make the point, and and yeah. it's in some ways it's a fair reading of uh, Jung, just like in some ways it's a fair fair reading of Freud. Yes. And he's, and, he's, and as an as an example to get the concept across, we could say that Jung looks into myth. He looks into uh, what can be thought of as irrational ideas where people really believe that um, Lao Tzu was born 600 years old. They mm -hmm. really believe that Jesus was born a virgin, born from a virgin. Well, from a virgin. Right? It, it's a they have a literal belief in a magical, irrational idea. It, does that, does my characterization of that um, fit for you? What do you think of that? Because I'm going to build on that. Yeah, well, I, what I'm hearing you saying is we've gone from the notion of something being like rational versus irrational, almost kind of it's binary, to Jung says it's non-rational, meaning he's taken the derogatoriness off and saying that we accept it more versus dividing and saying bad, good, versus these are both good, how do we... How do we integrate them even? Mm -hmm. How do we use I, them both? Okay, and, and I think that's a, that's a charitable interpretation of you. <laughs> and, and, I'll, and I'll go with that for a moment. But in terms of the pre-trans fallacy, the, the key is that if you differentiate between rational and non-rational, mm -hmm. right, then you end up in a binary system. Right? Rational is good with Freud, rational is good, irrational is bad. Same with Ayn Rand. Right? Rational is good, irrational is bad. With yes. Jung, we could say rational is limited and non-rational is spiritual and good. That's the source of values, it's the source of transcendence, it's where we want to go. So right. in this sense, non-rational is good, rational is bad. Gotcha. Right? And, and that. And that's the pre-trans fallacy. Ken Wilber suggests that there is a pre-rational, which is childish thinking. Yes. Right? Dad, please turn my spinach into ice cream. Right. Before, right. You've, even before you've even developed rationality, you, there is the pre-rational. Correct. Yeah. And, and in that pre-rational, you might end up saying things as a child that sound mystical. But really, it's just magic. <laughs> Oh, okay. Right? Uh, you, you, you believe that if you do the dance the right way, it is really going to rain. The dance is not a, a way of feeling into the energies of the natural system and binding the tribe together in terms of love. Right. You actually believe if we do this dance, it will rain. Ritual. If I perform these rituals, the gods will favor me. Yes. Something like yes. that. 
and, and, and in, in this idea, that's a pre-rational idea. We could say that science has been systematically taking the magic out of religion, delegitimizing all of those pre-rational views. Right? So you've got pre-rational, and then you go up to science and rationality. And what Ken Wilber says is one of the things that Jung was on to and that the spiritual traditions are on to is that there is a trans-rational perspective. Right? That there are experiences that go beyond the mind that right. are deeper and they have to do with consciousness itself yes and the idea of subject object dualism can actually be transcended so that there isn't a subject experiencing the objective world yes that there is only a consciousness which is experiencing itself Right, okay. and that goes beyond normal reason. It's transrational, not digression. It's transcending rationality. It's, yes, gotcha. The trans, the pre-trans is pre-transcendence. Yes, pre, yes. Sometimes it's called pre-rational and transrational. Okay. Right, and so when you get those confused, when 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 you take this three-tiered system of you could say childish thinking, magical thinking, pre-rational. You can develop into rationality, where you learn how to use logic and the validity of logic and science, and you start to test your beliefs and hypotheses and allow the data from reality to determine what's real. Yes. Right? And then there's a trans-rational, which uh, is about consciousness. It's about who it is or what it is that's experiencing this whole thing and why does it care? <laughs> right. right. Which is, and, you're getting into the realm of contemplation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Contemplative practices. You're not, you're not giving up rationality. You're suppressing it. You're just saying, oh, there's another level higher of consciousness to engage in. Yes. And the transrational transcends and includes rationality. That that's its characteristic. That if it's not including rationality, then it's not really transrational. Right. Right. <laughs> right? And, and, this, and this is the developmental idea altogether. And, and when you take this pre-trans, and, and he calls it the pre-trans fallacy, because if you're at rational, if you look at, let's say, the Dalai Lama who is talking about consciousness and meditation, <clears throat> right? or you're looking at a, a meditative practitioner who recognizes that the self of they, as they've known it, when they begin to interrogate it, disappears. And what's left is the space in which mind and experience happens. Right. If, from a rational perspective, if you look at that, you say, that's irrational. right? You take the pre-rational and you reduce it down into... Pre uh, uh, you take the transrational and reduce it down into pre-rational. Right, right. And that's one version of the of the pre-trans fallacy. This is Freud's version and Ayn Rand's version. Okay. Right? Ayn Rand says anything mystical is just childish thinking. That's the problem I have with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. And, it, and it's a leg it's a legitimate problem to have with her. Yeah. Okay. Now the other side of the pre pre-trans fallacy, is uh, attributed to Jung, but w we could say it's more, we could attribute it to New Age thinking, right? In New Age thinking, crystals and numerology and um, throwing bones and um, astrology uh -huh. are put into the same category as meditative awareness in the Dalai Lama, right? In this version, anything that's non-rational, including all of the pre-rational, is elevated into transrational status. Does that make sense? State that once again, for the, especially the beginning part. Sure. Um, when, you, when you make the binary difference, there is rational and then there is non-rational or spiritual. But you don't differentiate between pre-rational magical thinking and transrational contemplative thinking. If you don't differentiate between them, you say, well, they're both non-rational. Therefore, they're all spiritual. And you take crystals yeah. and numerology and um, right. 
right? Yeah. Magical thinking, and you elevate it as if it's spiritual, as if it's like the Dalai Lama speaking. I right? see. Yes. Yes, but how do you transcend and include even the magical as you come up the through the stages? I mean, mm -hmm. how do you not deny it? I mean, if you're so, 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 so when you when you say when you say how do you not deny it? Uh -huh. um, for it, example, it, if a if a child thinks that Santa Claus is real. Mm -hmm. Or they believe that their parents are have godlike qualities and they can just make things happen, right? How do you include that when you're talking with your child? First of all, you recognize that it's magical thinking, that it's not real, and you recognize they're at that stage, and you don't rock the boat, and you honor their perspective. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so from an integral perspective, we, we could say from Ayn Rand's perspective, what you do is you tell the child that's magical thinking. You know, yes. don't do that. Right. right. <laughs> and don't let anyone manipulate you by telling you they can do magic. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? So from the rational perspective, you, you castigate and you say all of that is bad. Right. right? From an integral perspective, you say, ah, that's magical thinking. It is not up to rational standards. Uh -huh. You wouldn't want to build a bridge on that. You don't want to build a bridge on that kind of thinking. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean that all non-rational thinking, it doesn't mean that the Dalai Lama is doing magical thinking, although he might <laughs> in different degrees, but with right. various teachings, it's talking about something greater. So the integral recognizes both the rational and the value of the rational and recognizes that people are where they're at in their development, and so you need to work with them where they're at so you can help them develop to the next stage. Does that make sense? Yes. So you wouldn't employ, employ or engage any way being transrational, the magical thinking, so, only, only recognizing it in others to consciously have a conversation with them or, yeah. in, or include them. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And you could say that that, uh, that is one of Ken Wilber's central ideas. In fact, I think that if you look at his, Wilb at his ideas, pre-trans fallacy is the most important of his mm -hmm. ideas, and the rest of it comes from that. It recognizes a developmental spectrum, and it recognizes that rationality plays a, a very important role in that. Rationality is what allows you to differentiate the transrational from the pre-rational. And until and unless you can differentiate the transrational from the pre-rational, any religious spiritual ideas that you have are going to be contaminated in magic. Oh. And you don't want to build a bridge on that. Yeah. Especially not a bridge to ultimate awareness. Yes. Yeah. Makes, makes perfect sense. Got it. Okay, yeah. great. Great. So you could say in this sense, one of Ken Wilber's, uh, <laughs> one of his insights is that if you look at any spiritual conversation, like you look out in the world and you look in the New Age, right? you look at the New Age movement, 90% of it is going to be pre-rational. Okay. Right? It, just in terms of percentages. Yes. 90% of it's going to be pre-rational, 10% is going to be transrational. What would the 10% look like? That's transrational. Um, I, I would say contemplative traditions. Are you familiar with uh, Sam Harris? No. Uh, Sam Sa Sam Harris has a, a wonderful new book out called Waking Up, uh -huh. which is about a non-religious approach to consciousness. You could say that that the transrational is all about exploring what is the nature of self, what is the nature of consciousness, right? Who and what is it that's experiencing all of this? And in the process of, you could say, turning your gaze, once you have a scientific capacity, once you have a rational capacity, you can then take that rational capacity and turn it inward on the phenomenological experience of self. Yeah. And we'd say that that's the transrational. And the part of the, part of the conversation in the New Age is, a, is teachers saying, ah, 
So notice that you care. What is it that's caring? Who do you think you are? How are you limiting yourself to the ideas in your mind when who you are is so much more than your mind? Makes, makes sense. Got it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so when you look at this pre-trans fallacy, if you say, okay, 90% of it is pre-rational claiming to be transrational. Right. Right? How do you differentiate between the transrational and the pre-rational? Because if you can't differentiate between those, if you can't tell the difference between magical thinking and mystical thinking, then you can't have an intelligent conversation about it. Right. You can't create a real framework in which you develop a developmental process and spectrum to go into higher levels beyond rationality if you can't differentiate the transrational from the pre-rational. Yes, quick question for you. Yeah. What, what about any of the of those who engage in the shamanic practices and traditions? Isn't that magical uh, also, or is that more... So, so that, that's, a great, that's a great intro and context to explore, you could say, the next stage in this conversation. So first, once, once we're clear about what the pre-trans fallacy is, and, and the idea that there's magical thinking, that rationality actually clears up magical thinking and recognizes it for what it is. Right, right. Right. And then once rationality is established, you can begin to start to use that same rationality to question our notions of self. Yes. And in the process, you start to get into transrational understandings of what it means to experience. That there's something beyond the mind, but it's not an abandonment of the mind. It's a refinement of the mind and the, the application of the mind to the experience of self and consciousness. I like that refinement of the mind. It's a re it's a refining process. Yes, yes. Yeah. And if if in when you look into the developmental process, at each stage you've got a cognitive development that makes the values development possible. Uh huh. Un you know, I like to say in in my world, I like to say you cannot make a choice that you don't perceive. You cannot right? make a choice you don't perceive. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. It's once you you have to understand the difference between X and Y before you can consciously choose to do X. Right. And that requires a cognitive capacity and differentiation. Yes. And you know, Ken Wilber might say you can't skip levels. Right. You can't yeah. go from a religious perspective, uh, an ethnocentric um, uh, revelation perspective through to a transrational perspective until you can do rationality. You can't go from um, right. Um, op in, you need to uh, you can't go from from child thinking to vision logic until you go through formal operational. You have to be able to abstract the ideas into terms and examine them rationally versus one another and in, in order to transcend that. Right, and that's you know, in in the great traditions, Buddhism, Zen, more particularly, is that one of the core teachings is discernment. You have to have discernment, which is rationality, taking your contemplative experience and discerning that, and which is very much like rationality or including rationality. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So now. If you have this understanding of rationality yeah. and you differentiate between pre-rational and transrational, then you're going to approach any spiritual experience, including a shamanic experience, from a different perspective than someone who doesn't make that distinction. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, so if you're going to look at a shamanic experience, we would say that... Um, I'm going to bring in another idea that Ken Wilber talks about, which is peak states, which is spelled P-E-E-K. Uh-huh. Right? So that you have a peak state where you kind of, you, ah, you get a new view for a small, you get a peak into a reality. Yes. But you can't stay there. 
right? You haven't developed the structures in order to stay there. And we could say a shamanic experience is a classic example of this. Uh -huh. Where you have a peak experience, right? You, you, you ingest the medicine and you, you see new worlds. But it doesn't sustain. It's just a what happens is you end up coming down. And right. on the medicine, you might be having a clear insight. Right? You're really experiencing a transrational experience of life and consciousness and the connection, what it means yeah. to be alive and all, all of that. Yeah. But you have to translate that experience in terms of your existing knowledge. Right. Right? So what happens is when you come, when you come down out of the experience, if your consciousness is at blue or amber, if your consciousness is at a re religious level, you're probably going to translate that experience in terms of your religion. So, oh, I saw Jesus. I was connected with God. God spoke to me. I am now a prophet. Yes, yes. Right, right. right. right? Or, yes. if you're, or if, let's say, you're at a lower level. If you're, if you're red, you might come out and say, I am now connected. I have the power to move space and time. I can make things grow, right? So... Right. You could say that the shamanic experience taps you into a, a causal level phenomenon where you're directly experiencing reality, a transrational set of phenomenological experiences. But, but you're, going to, you're going to interpret it at the level of your development and hang on to it there. And I just wanted to add that, you know, that's the, the peak experience is also Satori in Zen. Like Zen has Satori, uh, a moment of insight or a sustained moment, and then you have to translate it at that level. Yes, yes, and and um, I, I I will be I, I will be hesitant to equate a shamanic experience with a Satori experience, in that the ground that leads to both of them is radically different, and therefore the nature of the experience is radically different. But in terms of both of them being a causal level direct experience that goes beyond the mind, but isn't a fantasy, you're actually really experiencing it, and it's deep and profound, we could yeah. say that they share that. Yeah. See, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> I'm really getting this. Yes, good. Okay, awesome. Uh -huh. Awesome. So... Um, so with this idea, it, when you ask, what is a shamanic experience? How does it fit into this? <laughs> well, you could say that the experience itself has elements of pre-rational, magical, elements of rational, and elements of transrational. And it's how you interpret it from where you interpret it <laughs> that determines what it was. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. okay, now... Now, if you don't have, a, you could say, a well-developed rationality such that your transrational is the inclusion of a well-developed rationality, right? let's say that you're the average person where you've got some of your thinking is blue, amber, religious, ethnocentric, revelatory, what the group says is right is right. Mm -hmm. Right. My job is to be a good member of the group. My, go <laughs> my, my job is to obey the morality which is handed down. Right. Right. And some of your thinking is, no, I'm an individual. I think for myself. What I think is true is true. I like science. I care about evidence. Right. That's yeah. right. And part of your thinking is that. And then part of your thinking is more in the green realm where you're like, you know, I care about more than the individual. I care about the environment and the community. And it's not that the community is good, right? Like, whatever the community says is good. No, because there's lots of different communities and I understand a multiplicity of values and I want to honor each of those values for its own sake. Right? And you might even, right, and, and all of those are in spiral dynamics or elevations. Those are first tier. Right. Each one of them thinks that they're right. You might, even have, you might even have some integral thinking where you say, ah, some people are thinking religious thinking ethnocentric, yeah. some people are thinking individual thinking, some people are thinking more community, multi-perspective thinking. And yes. each one of them has its value, right? Yeah. yeah. So 
If you I, have quick, quick oh. question, yeah. Mark. So, uh, just also to clarify on that green level, is that the big thing is is it's non-hierarchical. Everybody is the same. There's no higher value to rationality, magic, uh, uh, ego, ethnocentric. Is that, and as soon as you start to speak to any kind of higher level, it, that just flames people out at the at the green level. Yeah. Well, and this and this brings in. Yeah, this is a good time. This brings in. Are you familiar with the concept of boomeritis? I don't know if you remember that from sex ecology and spirituality. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So, so boomer boomeritis. If we were to summarize it quickly. It's people who have green rhetoric. They have a lot of the logic and they understand the basic idea of multiple perspectives and that each perspective has something to offer. Right? But they don't have a solid orange. They don't have a solid rationality. They haven't really learned to differentiate between pre rational and trans rational. Oh. And so they. Like, the idea that you can take multiple perspectives and find value in each of them is a hierarchically better perspective to take than I'm right and you're wrong. Yes. Right? right? It, it's built into the perspective, but if you understand that, then, you're, then you are saying that hierarchy exists and it's good. Right. Right. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, they're kind of engaging in something that they're trying to deny at the same time. Yes. In fact, they must engage in it in order to say that other perspectives are good and that the idea of taking other perspectives is good. They've got good in there. Yes. Right? And, and so sometimes this is called the postmodern contradiction or a performative contradiction. Where yeah. in order to say that, you know, it's better to say that we look for value in all perspectives. You're saying, you know, and no perspective is better than any other perspective. Except for the one that says... That's, that's a hierarchical assertion. It is. Uh, this is the best. This is the highest. It is. Yeah. And, and so Ken, Ken Wilber suggests, he calls that boomeritis. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> it's where... People yeah. like that thought, and they think that they're better than other people who don't think that thought. And in right. a sense, they're correct. Because when you can include multiple perspectives, you can get the information from all of those perspectives. But, but, they, when, but they can't see that thought as... As... Better. better. <laughs> it's better. It's deeper. It's more profound. Yes, and it's and if they admit that, then they're bringing back in hierarchy. Yes, and they can't admit that. And and that to be able to hold both of those to be true, right? It requires a certain level of integration of green that a lot of people don't have. And so, boomeritis, as Ken Wilber describes it, is people who speak green. They use green rhetoric in order to. Um, justify red <laughs> values, power values. I am better than you. Our group is better than yours. We should have power. You shouldn't have power. Those right. people should be, you know, yes, we should knock them down a peg, and those yeah. people are wrong, and those people... And that, and the, the irony of boomeritis is that you've got a group that says that each person's perspective should be valued unless you disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 And 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 so he calls that boomeritis, and it's yeah. and it's this I it's this it's it's an inability to differentiate between transrational or postrational, mm -hmm. which is the recognition that each perspective has value, from pre-rational, which is that you're not better than me. Yeah. Yeah. The the mean green aspect of things. Yes, he calls he calls it the mean green meme. Uh huh. Right. It's this idea that if you're green, you can deconstruct anything. Right. To the flatland. To flatland. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. 
there's no nothing is should stand out or be unique. Everything is flat. Yes. Flat? Or nothing should be better than anything else. And anyone who suggests that something is better than anything else must be deconstructed, must and, be borne down into this flatness. Anybody who stands up with an actual superior moral idea, such as we ought to take each person's perspective into account. Right. If they claim that kind of moral superiority, they must be knocked down into this flat moral space. As, as they're asserting that my moral position is the best. Yes, yes, and that's the performative, con and, and Ken Wilber calls that pathological green. So it's, it, at each of the levels, there's a, there's a healthy version and a pathological version. Right. If, you t if you take your logic too far on that particular level and deny the other levels, you can get into pathological territory. Right. And that's certainly, if there's, if there's any real legitimate critique of Ayn Rand. It's that she takes orange too far. She does not recognize green. She does not recognize blue. She does not recognize integral. It's like rationality is it. Anything anything that's not specifically rational is irrational. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Now, so you could say that is the downside of green is boomeritis. <laughs> Where yeah where you don't recognize that both hierarchy is good and um, identifying and appreciating each person's perspective and what and the gifts that they bring is good. Right? You need that both and. Yeah. And that's and it's that recognition of that both and and the and the challenges of that that, that lead to integral. Yes. Beautiful, yeah. It's both and not either or. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you could say that's I, I, that's a nice summary of the integral perspective. Sometimes people call me. Uh, some of my friends call me Mark Both and Lewis because anytime you bring me an either or question, I always answer both and. Yes. Right. Because yes. there's multiple levels involved always, all the time. Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So again, so we've got some pieces set up now. If we say that the problem with Ayn Rand is that she she says anything non-rational is bad. Right, and and you could say a lot of people are familiar with that critique of Ayn Rand. The question is, what's good in Ayn Rand that we want to include in an integral perspective? Mm -hmm. Right? Why why have I spent twenty three years investing thousands of hours, and still every month or so I read, you know, probably an an hour a week in Ayn Rand. Wow. Right. Yeah. Why do I believe that's so valuable? How do I believe Ayn Rand fits into this integral framework? Okay. Right? Because there's the obvious critique, which is that she says all mysticism is bad, all religion is bad, end of story. Okay. Right? Uh, and and that's an, that oversimplifies religion. It, can, it collapses the 90% magical thinking, right? 90% mm -hmm. <laughs> of most religious thinking is magical thinking. And Ayn Rand is right to critique it. Yeah. But, <laughs> right? But it doesn't, it doesn't take into account the mystical thinking which questions the nature of self. Not denies it. Not says, oh, the self isn't good. Right? Just like denying the mind. You don't... Uh, spiritual teachers don't deny the mind. They say the mind is necessary in order so, for you to have dis discernment. As well as ego. You know, you're not trying to deny ego or subvert ego or crush ego. Is you're trying to have a healthy ego and transcend ego. Is this yes. Yes. We, we, we could we could say if we look at spiral dynamics of elevation, it's to expand what you think the ego is uh -huh. until it includes everything. Okay. Until it includes all of experience, right? First, it's like I have my position in my group, my status in my group, red. Right. Right. And then, oh, I have my position as an obedient person in my eth in my ethnic group, in my religion. Yes. I'm a good person. Right? I yes. fit the beliefs. And then you go, no, no, myself is the part of me that thinks. I'm an actual individual. Oh my gosh. And I can figure out how the world works. Oh. 
Well, when I really look at how the world works, I notice that different people have different perspectives and that they have something to offer just like I have something to offer. It's not about right and wrong. It's about both and. Right. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. So this whole idea of community, I can be part of that community in green. Like myself can include not just my group, but all of humanity, perhaps even all of the globe, perhaps even nature itself. The cosmos? As the cosmos. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right? It, it's like, oh, okay, so that's myself. But is it me that's including the world? What is this idea of me? And then you start getting into the more spiritual realms, the more realms of consciousness, where you say, oh, so do what is this thing called a self? Does the self really exist, or is it a figment of my imagination? Am I my thoughts, my experiences, my memories, my rationality, my desires, my motivations? Am I that, or am I something more or less? Right, and so our ego expands to include more and more. It transcends the, the me that I used to think that I was. I recognize that my previous self-concept was inadequate to the reality of who I am. Yeah, yes. I wanted to ask you real quickly, you know, with everything that you mentioned, and I keep kind of just glossing over, is that in anything that there's a shadow to it, you know, if we're talking about Wilbur's work, and I just, you know, is that something you want to speak to? or? You know, um, actually I will, but let me do it after I do this because I'll be able to use the... I'm, you could say, what's the shadow of Ayn Rand? What's the value of Ayn Rand? Then we can look at what's the shadow of Wilbur, what's the value of Wilbur. Okay, okay. Okay, awesome. So, so if, if we say the, sh the shadow or the downside of Ayn Rand is pathological orange. It's taking rationality and denying anything else value. Right? The value is that it's rationality that allows us to differentiate between magical thinking and transrational thinking. Rationality is the foundation on which we build an appreciation for other people's rationality, for other people's perspective. The more we get our rationality solid, the higher we can build. The better our orange is, the more fruitful our green will be. Mm. The better our orange is, the more we'll be able to understand the integral perspective where we can where we can differentiate between what's true, like what's factual, uh -huh. and what people are actually experiencing and how we can partner with them right. to actually create a better world and help them recognize and realize deeper experiences of self and community. Yes, yeah. Right? And it's rationality, orange has a special place in this process of human development. It is a transition point. It is a fulcrum which is um, that, that I'm going to argue has a special value because it's how we operationalize our own thinking. Right? Uh, one, of, one of my uh, mentors is a guy named Jason Alexander. Mm -hmm. And he says the first realization of human being is when we came to terms with reality. Right? We came to terms. We started naming things. We started taking uh, the, bull, the experience of things and we turned them into constructs that we could work with. And then our mind could start to fit them together. Right. And that's where we started creating the, the human way of being. Uh -huh. Which is that we actually put things together which are non-obvious. <clears throat> and that creates a way of life. So that's yeah. the first thing is we came to terms with terms, right? We had a metaphysical realization where the stuff of reality became something because once we name something, it becomes what it is. Before, it's just kind of like it's just part of our experience. But once we focus on something sufficiently enough and make it distinct, discern its particular nature enough to give it a name, uh -huh. it becomes something distinct in our experience. We create yeah. distinctions. And, and through, through all of our development is that 
underlying our conscious experiences, we want a certainty and a clarity. This is reality. Would you agree? Like, yes, this is true. I, I do believe that that is built into the the nature of humanity, perhaps the nature of consciousness itself. Right. Right. It's t it's to take um, what's sometimes called the blooming chaos, the blooming buzzing chaos of experience, uh, right, <laughs> and turn it into something that we can grasp. Right. right? Right, we say we say, oh, I grasp that now. I it's now something I can get my fingers into around. Right, right. it becomes and and it the fundamental human thing. We manipulate things. We we take them to hand. We grasp them. We take something that was I couldn't get a it was slippery. I couldn't right. get a handle on it, and then right. I got it, and now I grasped it. Right, it becomes something. Right, the, the, we. The, the, we we it, come to terms with it, is a way of saying it. To bring, to bring order out of chaos. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Now, the thing is that we might bring a false order out of chaos. Right? We might go, oh, what's happening is the, the spirit has come into the tree and therefore the tree is growing, and then the spirit left the tree, and so the tree died. Right. We came to terms with it. We sort of grasped it, but it was inaccurate. Right. But, what, but we look for people of a like mind, a community who affirms our experience. Oh, you think like I do, beautiful. Or, you know, we share the same beliefs. Excellent. There's a sense of belonging to that. You want to belong. Com com and community. Community. Right, right. Or as in Ken Wilber's terms, uh, communion. Right. Commun he differentiates between agency on the one hand and communion on the other. Right. Right. And, and this brings us back to uh, uh, Ayn Rand because she's more on the agency side. And right. ag agency, how we speak of it is... Agency is, I do this, I take responsibility, I choose, I desire, I'm doing what I think is true. I am being an agent in the world. I am being agentic, taking action, taking responsibility. Yes. Right? Versus communion, which is, I am letting myself go to be part of a group. There's the statement of I, this is what I think, the growth of ego versus the dissolution of ego into the group. Right. And uh, there's a dance between those. But even in that I do agency is that the I do agency people seek out others with that kind of conviction like themselves. Oh, I can trust you because you have a strong conviction about I do. And so they build community out of the I doers. Yes. Know? You do that, I do this, and we're strong and strength, and we have strength. Yeah. And let's collaborate to do another big I do, you know? And that's how we build wealth and prosperity, and you've got an expertise, and I've got an expertise. You focus on that, I'll focus on this. Is that fair? Uh, I, I, think, I think it's not only fair, it's a key insight that it is through independence that we create interdependence. Right. That interdependence requires independence. Yes. And, and we can say that at any one moment, or perhaps in any one personality through time, some people tend to be more comfortable in the agency role versus the, communi uh, versus the communion role. Right. Right? Where it's like, I'm not looking for a group to be a part of. I'm not looking for a group to be a part of. I do want people who share my values so that we can create together. Right. right? And that in itself is a community group, though. You yes. Can, so it's kind of a paradox. Yeah. Yes, or it's, it's, a, it's a Russian doll. Right. Uh -huh. First you create the self, 
then you create the community around the self. Then you go beyond the community to say, okay, but who am I beyond this community? And you create a self, and then you find others who have that self. And that is a hierarchical, um, growing, deep experience of self and community. Yes, yes. Right? Versus, you could say there's another way of doing community, which is that um, I'm with a group of people who think uh, a particular way. And so I'm going to think that the way they think, I'm going to think the way they think, mm -hmm. because that way I'll belong. Right. And it's and not, it's, it's not, what do I actually think? I actually haven't examined uh -huh. whether or not this idea is accurate or true or useful. Like, uh -huh. It's just that everybody thinks that, and so that's what I think, and now I belong. Well, but yeah, now, it's a strong desire to belong. And, and so that's where you get culture. You know, what are the cultural norms? Well, well, right. so, so, so this is, to, to, to take the two things which we just said, some people have more of a desire for agency, and the communion comes from who matches what I care about. Yeah. Right? Whereas other people are, um, how do I belong? And my sense of self comes from belonging. Right? And you could say that those are two different patterns. One is, look, I'm willing to say goodbye to the group. Screw the group. I don't care if you like me or not. This is what's true for me. Right? I'm willing to sacrifice my belonging to follow my truth. Yes. That's the agentic move. Right? Got it. But, but that, that takes a particular kind of courage. Yeah. Right? And you might not find someone who agrees with you. Right? You might, because you're not seeking a group, you might become an individual who does not have a community. Like I, me. <laughs> I, yeah, like me. Right? I, there, there, I have a whole series of things that I care about deeply. Right. That other people don't even see. Yeah. Right? There, I have things that I, that I wake up every day and I work on that I share with absolutely no one. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And yeah. it's lonely in a particular way. Right? And, and, and that's the choice I make. In order to follow my truth, wherever it goes, as far as it goes, I leave behind the group. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, for, Do, Mark, to clarify yeah. your point, we, you said, I got the clarity on the, the agency piece of I am, I will, I will take the courage to say, fuck you to the group, I don't agree, versus the one to, who belongs says, I'll suppress, I'll suppress my needs, or I'll suppress my desire to speak out because I want to get along, and belong. Mm -hmm. Basically. Yes. Yes. Okay. And 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 so now I so with that distinction, I want to add in another level or layer, which is that when you're dealing with the child and the child's doing magical stuff. Right as as the as the meme goes, hey, it doesn't matter how tough you are, when a three year old hands you a plastic phone, you answer it. That's right. <laughs> right. When your, when your daughter's dancing in her fairy dress, she's a fairy. She's a fairy. Ex That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Now, do you really think she's a fairy? No. No. Think that she's playing that, and you're willing to go into her world. In this sense, the relationship between agency and community, between being true to yourself and being part of a group, is not either or. It's both and. It's hierarchical. You keep yourself, and you enter the world of the group. Right. Right. You are not denying your truth in order to be part of the group. Yes. But you're not denying the group in order to be yourself. Perfect this sense. Is, this is independence leading to interdependence. Yeah. However, right, 
let's take this let's take this more let's say I'm at a party not that this ever happens to me <laughs> right and the people around me are saying the currently popular political jargon of the day and spouting out economic theories that they really don't understand uh -huh. <clears throat> right right and i have a tremendous amount of education in the economics thing and i and i actually can teach it and i could say oh you know so here's the economic theory you're stating and here's what its presuppositions are and here's where it goes wrong and here's how you might want to think about it right because that would make me really popular <laughs> or People just love that right? or a buzz kill a buzz kill yeah yeah and th and there was a time in my life especially in my uh, in my 20s where I thought that was my job yeah I thought yeah. my job was to educate people on edu economics when they didn't know what the hell they were talking about especially at a party especially at a party yes I was incredibly popular uh -huh. um, but now so I go oh I'm not going to agree with them I'm not going to pretend like I agree with them I am not going to sell myself out I am not going to misrepresent who I am and I'm not going to change who I am right if they say something intelligent I'll try to learn from it because that's intelligent right, right. Right. right, but if they spout off something that it's pretty clear they don't know what the hell they're talking about, uh -huh. like the child who is a fairy, right? I'm going to I will often overlook their their mistakes in logic and knowledge. Like they just don't know. Like if the, if they're 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 well-meaning people, mm -hmm. they have good hearts. They just have a misunderstanding mm -hmm. right so I'm just gonna focus on I might focus on the values which I agree with rather than the economics so I can enter their world and I can be part of them without selling myself out right I can be part of the belonging without giving up myself does that make sense it does but what would that look like entering into the values versus entering into the disagreement uh, well, so th the the easiest way to put it is um, someone really cares about the poor, right? Right, and so they say, ah, what we should do is tax the rich and give the money to the poor, and that will solve the problem. Right, right. Which you wouldn't agree with. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I I agree with it in the first analysis. If you take money from some people and give it to other people. Right. The people who you give it to will get the benefit of the money. Right. right. I, I can agree with that. Right? I feel compassion for people who are in tough economic times. I've been there. Uh -huh. I know what it's like to not have enough money to pay your bills and to have tragic, horrible consequences come from that. Right. Right. I, I both have compassion and I have empathy because I've experienced it, right? Yes. Right? So I can connect with them on that. Right? And I, I can connect with them on their desire to do something. I can I can connect with them on the the cognitive distance that comes when some people are doing very well and other people aren't aren't, aren't doing well at all from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. Right? So those are all levels that I can, I can be in community with those people, and I can connect with them, right? So, without yeah. giving up, without giving up my understanding of you could say the long-term consequences of taking from some people and giving to another, right? Because there's a whole series of secondary consequences that come from that, which right. are not as pretty as the initial pieces. Yes. So right. rather, than get, rather than engage them intellectually, argumentatively on that issue, go at them with the empathy of the original concern. There's something wrong in people's lives. Yes, that's how I can connect with them, and I can have the experience of being part of the group and part of right. I can experience the belonging that is naturally pleasurable, naturally valuable. Yeah, 
Yeah. I, now, I, I, context, 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 context. So I just want to make sure is that you may do that at a party, not to be create an, an argumentative situation, but in the context of a problem solving group where you're sitting at a table where people we need to come up with some ideas. You would want to assert. My what? best possible understanding of yes. what will work, and my best possible understanding of challenges with approach other approaches yes. that are suggested. Yes. So it's context. Because, context, because in context. that context, my bringing my difference is in service. Yes. In in if I do it in a party, why am I doing that? What am I trying to achieve? Now it might be that I want people to know who I am because I know that certain people in the group are going to say, ooh, I like that. Right. Right? And I'm willing to risk other people not liking it in order to connect with people who care about the things I care about. And Right? One of my favorite quotes is, I don't remember who said it, but he says, I write to gain the respect of people I respect. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. I write and, and that's how I try to live my life. I, I want to gain the respect of people I respect. And the people I respect are people who follow the truth to its heart wherever it leads and whatever the cost. Yes. That is, my, that is a fundamental virtue for me. That's what I care about. And, and that's why I question the self. <laughs> right? that's, wh that's why I meditate. That's why I go beyond the, the normal understanding of self because... I believe that the facts warrant it. <laughs> and, and, and your experience warrants it. Yes, yes. My, ex my experience of the facts and my rational interrogation of what I want, how I feel, why I'm doing it, and the more I interrogate that, the more I find a richer experience beyond the normal idea of self. Yeah. Right? And so, yeah. so that's what I value. Now... So, so I'm suggesting that one way of approaching this is that you could go into the party and say, well, this is what I believe, and if you disagree with me, then you're wrong. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's, that's definitely going to be agentic. Right? It's, it's going to be self-reinforcing, which has its own value and its own nobility. Right? I am not going to lie in order to have you like me. Yeah. Right? I believe that that's a noble position. Yeah, it's almost it's almost red in its the way you the way you're making it. It's almost red in its fierceness of I'm I'm of this tribe and you're of that tribe and you're wrong and I'll you know. if, if you're arguing like that yeah yes it is it's very much red right right or it might be blue no look this is the right way to think and the way you're thinking is wrong right that's right. blue yeah. Right. right. It's kind of a religious ethnocentric amber. Right. Right. Whereas you could say orange is, no, this is how it works. Here are the facts. Okay, what are your facts? Let's look at this logically and rationally. Who has the better argument? <laughs> right. And that's where it gets really complex because we can rationalize some very, I mean, this is hopefully where our political discourse takes place. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in my experience, it doesn't much, which is why I, which is why, other than for the joy of the joust, I rarely get involved in political conversations. Yeah. Okay. If it's fun for me to do it, because, oh, I'm going to say it this really cool way, and in the process, I'll be clarifying my thoughts, and I'll have a new piece of writing that it goes in one of my books, or yeah. one of my blogs, right? Okay, that's useful. Or I really think that the person I'm speaking with has a good heart, right? And that if they get an alternate perspective, they will actually consider it and use it, right? That's another time that I'll offer that. It comes, it comes back to the example you used. If you're in a problem-solving group where the goal is for people to come together and correct one another's thinking so that the group can come up with a better overall choice. Right. If that's the context, then that kind of conversation is valuable. But in most other contexts, it's just a it's just a pissing contest. It's just ego. Right. Right. Fun. Yeah. I, I I love doing it. I love getting in a good argument. However, uh, it doesn't it doesn't 
further the values that the argument is in service of? It doesn't serve anything other than maybe promoting, you know, I won, I won that argument. I want to yeah. win this argument. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay, so in, in this context, I'm going in there, I'm keeping myself, I'm not selling myself out. I am, I am not giving up myself so that the group will accept me. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm saying that that is a noble, selfish thing to do. It is, it is putting yourself above the group. That's selfless. That's a selfless thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and th and this is you could say. When I think about Ken Wilber and Ayn Rand, uh huh. From my perspective, their disagreements are trivia. They agree on virtually everything. They agree on virtually everything. The few places that they disagree are mostly semantic. It's yes. mostly semantic, right? Now, if if you want to say that what I'm doing is selfless. Uh -huh. Right? Then that what you're doing is defining selfless a particular way. And and based on how you're using it, I agree. Oh. Right? right? But but from other people's perspective, what I'm doing is fundamentally selfish. Does that make sense? Because I'm putting myself, the truth of myself, the integrity of myself, I am saying is more important than being liked. Yes. Well, every connotation I have with selfish is negative. Which is, you know, just selfish is, um, you know, it, it has a negative connotations for me. But the yeah. way you're, the way you're framing it, selfishness is good. Which yes. is also what I've always had a problem with Ayn Rand with is the selfish, yes. the selfishness. Yes. She, Ayn Rand wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. I know. <laughs> this is what she's talking about. This is the virtue of selfishness. I have just described for you the virtue of selfishness, which is that you put your most rigorous understanding of the truth above what any group says because you are not going to sell out your truth to the group. That would be that would be immoral. It would it would be disrespecting to put it in religious terms, it would be disrespecting God. It would be disrespecting spirit. It would be disrespecting reality to deny what you believe to be true and valuable in order to fit into a group. That that is the, in fact, she calls that the ultimate evil. That is what evil is. Evil is the choice to deny the truth in order to fit in or in order to get power. And that song, that, the, the way you describe that is just, that sounds... You know why? That's horrendous. And, it, and uh, what's coming up for me is is the sense of you're surrendering your integrity. Why and surrender your integrity to other people? That so if you understand that you understand Ayn Rand. Everything else flows from that. Everything wow. else flows from that. It, that is the insight. And wow. and and I'll, I'll say one more thing. Ken Wilber talks about the three strands of valid knowledge. Are you familiar with that? Of what? The three strands of valid knowledge. Valid knowledge. No. Yes. Like, like, so, so he, he looked at the, you could say, the scientific method, the idea of philosophy and science. How do we determine whether something is true? Right? What's the methodology we use to differentiate true from false, fact from fiction, pre, uh, transrational from pre-rational? What's the methodology? And he said, when he looked at science and he said there's basically three, three steps or three strands. Okay? The first step is that you have to have an injunction. You have to have a procedure, a, a set of instructions that says if you do X, you will, see, you will discover Y. Right? First step, the first strand is to have an injunction. Right? If you want to know if it's raining, you have to go outside and look. Mm. Right? That's the injunction. It's a set of instructions that will give you an answer. Right? The second strand, the second step, is that you actually have to perform the injunction. <laughs> yeah. Right? You actually have to go outside and look. Yeah. 
right? If you know the injunction but you don't do it, it doesn't count, right? You are not, you do not have sufficient knowledge to do it. And the third strand is he calls testing your answer that you got from step number two by performing the experiment, by, by um, executing the injunction, to check your knowledge with a community of the adequate, right? What's a community of the adequate? It's the people who know the injunction and who have performed the experiment, <laughs> right? The, and you talk right. with them and say, what did you find? Yes, right. Right? And that it's that process by which we get real knowledge. Those, those are the three strands of valid knowledge. You have, to, you have to learn, you have to have the instruction, the injunction. You have to execute the injunction. You have to perform the experiment. And then you have to check your results in a community of the adequate. Which is very much the, you know, essentially my background being in meditation and spiritual communities, particularly Zen, is that, you know, Zen, you sit on the cushion, you do the koan, you do the breathing, you do the meditation, then you go before the master, and the master says, ah, more, more work, or you're getting there, or you're coming along. So, or, or in any mentoring relationship or any community where you're investing research, investigation, experience, am I, am I on the right track? But that also opens up the notion, the next notion of what about innovation? What about going on beyond the established yeah. norms? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you think about it in terms of science, right, uh, the, the uh, Semmelweis... Uh, in, when they were first discovering germ theory and thinking about germ theory, right? He came up with this idea that you know w the reason why so many mothers are dying at this particular birthplace, and the reason why so many surgery patients are dying from infection, is because the doctors are actually carrying something about being clean. If the doctor isn't clean, then it it actually creates this kind of infection because the doctors used to do one surgery they'd be covered in blood and they'd go do the next surgery because they didn't understand germ theory they didn't understand antiseptic technique and so he said wow let's do this and the other doctor said oh no that's stupid you know it's not going to work blah, blah blah there wasn't sufficient germ theory had been developed yeah but what he did was he said, okay, he developed this technique, and it was very elaborate, and it basically involved washing and using different kinds of solvents, and like to. And so he performed an experiment, and fewer of his patients died from infection. Right, and what happened was he taught that injunction to other people: you must clean in between. Some people understood it, they performed the experiment, and then when enough of them got enough data saying, you know what, this really works, then it became an established medical fact, and it's changed the way we've done surgery ever since. So he took, he took the innovation, he took the frothy edge, recreated something on it, stepped out, and came and back... Turned and turned it into an injunction. He went from beyond intuitive artistry into a step-by-step -step procedure that could be tested. Yes. Beautiful. Oh my. Uh -huh. And and abs and absolutely Ken Ken Wilber uses Zen as the perfect example or as a great example of this. If you want to know if Zen works to produce enlightenment, you must do the Zen. You must learn the instructions, you must perform the instructions and then look. What do you get? Until you have performed those instructions, you cannot judge the results of the experiment. It's inappropriate. You're not part of the community of the adequate. Your perspective doesn't matter. Oh, <laughs> yes. That's, yes, that's, uh, that's right. Okay, yeah. so, with, so with that idea, here's what I would suggest around Ayn Rand. <clears throat> Ayn Rand has created a systematic philosophy. She has done what, in my experience, no other philosopher has done in the Western tradition. Right? 
Just like Ken Wilber has done something that no one else has done, which is he created an integral map in which yeah. to put all the different pieces. Ayn Rand has gone through the philosophy of human thriving. That's what I call it. Oh. Right? And she has created a systematic thing where every thought you have about human thriving all fits into a single system. It is consistent and it is philosophically beautiful and demanding. It is a set of injunctions. It is a set of philosophical injunctions. Right? And she has said, look, here is a set of perspectives. If you want something to be actually valid, if you want to say, ah, this is better for human beings than this, this is better for the group than this, this is better for the person than this, right? If you're going to make a moral judgment, if you're going to make a factual judgment, if you're going to make an aesthetic judgment, if you're going to make a political judgment about the nature of reality and human being, if you don't look through this lens at it, right, you will predictably make bad mistakes. And if you look through this lens, the mistakes will become obvious. They just become obvious. Right? It's like once you have the distinctions, mm -hmm. you examine any concept and you go, oh, okay, well, so that's wrong for this, this, and this reason, right? Because this leads to this and this leads to this. Have you thought of how, if you're going to say X, how do you deal with why? Uh, and I know that you're not going to be able to deal with why. Because there's no way to get from X to Y. They're different worlds. They're different philosophical worlds. And, and Ayn Rand is a set of injunctions, which is similar to a Zen training. It's the equivalent of a Zen training. It takes a couple years of working with her concepts to see how they all fit together into a united whole. And once you have that united whole, then when you know when people say various things in terms of philosophy you immediately see where their mistakes are it's just like oh it's like okay that so n now you're at a party how do you deal with that <laughs> okay well so so anyway that that's that is what i'm suggesting i'm asserting that ayn rand is it's a okay. she comes from a philosophical standpoint which is about rationality which is about rationally what is good for human beings. How to have a solid orange so that mm -hmm. you can build a great green and a great integral. And unless you have what Ayn Rand offers, your integral perspective will predictably be filled with boomeritis. Do you know, is, is, is that Ken Wilber's basic, is that how he also feels about Ayn Rand? Do you know that by chance? Or... What has, um, what's so, so again, there are semantic issues. As, as I understand it, because I haven't heard him talk about it much, what I've heard him say is that Ayn Rand is brilliant at orange. And if, and if you take that in the context of the rest of what Ken Wilber says, which is that you know, transrational <laughs> comes from yeah. differentiating transrational from pre-rational, then how good you get at orange is where it's all at. Now, I don't know how well Ken Wilber has learned Ayn Rand's philosophy. Oh, okay. But he does, he, I'll, does, he I'll, does... I'll make the assertion that to the degree that he has, he will agree with it. Okay. okay. But if he made that statement, yeah, so if you want to solidify your orange development, Ayn Rand is the source. Uh, and then... A paragon example of it. And, yeah. And, and from my understanding of Western philosophy and you know all the people that I've read, she does a better job of it than anybody else, bar none. There's really I don't know anyone who touches her. Yeah. How are you using when you said thriving? Mm -hmm. How are you using that? When I hear thriving, I typically think of financial thriving. Are you using it in a different way or inclusive of that? So so I have I have a you could say all of my work is about defining the term thriving. Oh. Right. That's all I all I really do is define the term thriving because I'm I am of my basic philosophy says that people do what they think is right. They yes. do what they think is best. 
Now, sometimes what they think is best is to sell themselves out in order to fit into a group. Yes. Right. Sometimes what they do they right. think is best is it's, to it's kill. It's a mistake. Yeah, yeah. It's a mistake. What they're doing is they're disintegrating themselves in order to be part of a group, and they get some benefits from that and some negatives from that. But if they understood thriving better, they would make better choices. Right? You don't put your hand on a hot stove. Why? Because hey. it's because it's immoral to do it. Because the group doesn't approve. Because it's you know, it's it doesn't serve all. Uh -huh. Right? No, you don't put your hand on a hot stove because it burns. You do it for yourself. Yeah. You do it because it has the self thrive. It has the human being thrive. So is it just financial? Absolutely not. Any dimension you can think of. Right? Relationships. What do you want? You want love and intimacy and fun and caring and teamwork and that kind of stuff. So thriving would be having more love, more intimacy, more caring, right? You'd be thriving on all of those dimensions. Right. Thriving is the ultimate good. Like so so postmodernism has taken the word good and delegitimized it. Right? There is no meta good. There's only what one person says is good or another person says is good. Uh-huh. And I say bullshit. Uh huh. Right. Right. There is the the concept of good is a theoretical construct which points towards better. Excellence. Right. It, yeah. Excellence. The fulfillment of what's possible of what's possible. My work is called Telosians. The Telos. The the natural goal or end the fulfillment of our potential the telos, and science, knowledge, so knowledge of our ultimate potential, right? Thriving. Thriving is the realization of our ultimate potential. Right. It's a stand-in word, which means good, like really, really good, like more love, more intimacy, more teamwork, more fun, more compassion. More I, I'm, coming, I'm coming up with flourishing. You're flourishing sure. in something. Sure. Thriving, flourishing. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And and that's what Ayn Rand cared about, huh? But and and then as the Buddhist in me is coming into this, I just as a side note, I'm thinking of the people who become attached to the notion of thriving, of like, well, I shouldn't have pain, I shouldn't experience suffering. Not that you should go out of your way to do that, but this sense of almost. You know, everything becomes in the shadow. Oh, I don't want to feel mm -hmm. because that. I don't want to feel feel lonely be, because then I'm not thriving. Is that how does that land for you? Well, so uh, first of all, I absolutely recognize that. I think that's a fundamental human thing. You can say, "Oh, I'm not being spiritual enough." Uh huh. Right. I right. need to stop judging myself. I'm failing because I judge myself at judging myself. <laughs> right. It's a right? Vicious circle, right? Right, right. So in your estimation, as you think about it, which is which is better? To be fixated on thriving or to just work to thrive? Work to thrive. Yeah. That's thriving. Right? Getting fixated on thriving is less thriving than not being fixated on it. Right. In fact, the less fixated are, you are on it, while at the same time pursuing it with your best intelligence, your greatest passion, your, your deepest love and passion and caring and compassion for others so that you want them to thrive too, mm -hmm. that's more thriving. Huh. Okay. And with and with that, you're op and so you're asserting that you're operating at the level of orange with this uh, sense of self. To do I, this? I'm saying I'm saying that the fundamental idea of agency that we were talking about, which is that I am not going to sell myself out. I am going to do what I believe to be true and right, and I am going to use my best most rigorous, uncompromising confrontation of the truth. And and I am going to do what I believe is true and right, even if other people don't like it. Skillfully. S skillfully, yes. That yeah. is healthy orange. 
Gotcha. Right? It's, it's not, I'm trying to get power in the group, red. It's not, I'm trying to be a good person according to the rules of the group, blue or amber. Right. right? It's, I believe that there are things which are good and true, and I am going to follow those. I am going to work. I am going to take responsibility. Right? In my language, I'll put it in my language for a moment. Right. Uh, so in the, you could say that the Greeks and Aristotle um, broke philosophy down into three or five categories in you know, different ways of looking at it. There's metaphysics, what is, what's reality. Uh -huh. Epistemology, how do we know it, right? Once we've come to terms with reality, we come to terms with terms. We start to use logic to critique logic. We start to question our accuracy and how we know what's true. Right. Right? So there's metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. What's good? Right? What is good? What is the fulfillment of human being? What is good versus bad? Right? And, and you can think of ethics has two major branches, or three major branches. There's like what makes the human being thrive, including how do they thrive in groups, politics. Right? How do you extend goodness to groups? That's right. the question of politics. And how do you extend goodness to wonder and awe and beauty or aesthetics and art? Aesthetics. Yeah. Right? So you've got metaphysics, epistemology, right? ethics, politics, and aesthetics. These are the five major branches of philosophy. And another way of putting that is you want reality. If you want thriving, you focus on reality. Right? You want thriving in reality. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. You want to use your best reason to discover it. You want to use your most rigorous thinking and honesty to question, to question your understanding and make it better and better and better. So you want to use reason with reality. And then you want uh, responsibility. You want to take responsibility for who you are, what you're going to create. You are the moral agent. You will do the good. Right? And then you want to do respect. Right? Where you respect other people's right to use responsibility and reason to deal with reality. You respect their individual rights. Right. You work with them through cooperation. Right. Right? In, in service of realization, in service of realizing what's possible for human beings in terms of beauty and love and compassion and spiritual transcendence. Yes. Right? And these five, right? This is, these five pieces are the five pieces of Ayn Rand's philosophy. She says, look, you need to deal with re reality. Focus on reality, not fantasy. You need to use reason. Uh -huh. Right? Not what you want to be true, but, but you need to use rigorous logic. You need to take responsibility right. because only the individual thinks. The, res the individual is the one who says, this is what's true for me. And so the individual needs to take responsibility. And then respect. You need to respect that other people have their own worlds, that they have their own values, and that as long as they're not hurting someone else. And, right? have, your own, and have your own self-respect. Yes, and have your own self-respect, right? To respect others as you respect yourself and to respect yourself as you would respect others. Right, yeah. Don't get too one way with it, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and then realization, which is what is beautiful, what is good, what is the fulfillment of human beings, which is what Ayn Rand heroes are all about. In Ayn Rand's books, she has heroes and villains. Oh, yes. Right? The heroes are the people who deal with reality, use their best reason, take responsibility, respect others, Right? All of Ayn Rand's heroes are com incredibly respectful to other people. Always. Invariably. Right? They never force others to do things. It's always, look, here's what I want to do. Do you want to play? Right? All of her heroes. Absolutely. And all of them are, do are pursuing their vision of beauty through work. Right? This is what makes an Ayn Rand hero. Reality, reason, responsibility, respect, and realization. That's what makes an unearned hero. 
It sounds like that, that what Wilbur came up with was truth, beauty, goodness. His three core. Remember? Are you familiar yes. with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like he took the five, made them three almost. You can say that. You can say, okay, there's truth, which is reality and reason. Right. There's goodness, which Ethics. is morality and politics. Right. And then there's beauty. Ethics, aesthetics. Which is aesthetics, which is realization. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, correct. Correct. I, I, and, I, and I think that it's a useful way, especially when you put it in the quadrants model. Um, he modeled Plato on that. And um, I'm an Aristotelian, not a Platonist. Oh, right. So that and and differentiating between reality and reason is an Aristotelian move. Oh, okay. Right. Differentiating between goodness and politics is an Aristotelian move. Plato didn't make those distinctions clearly like Aristotle did. Yeah. Mark, you are so a very. Had, so he had good truth. He had truth, goodness, and beauty versus Plato. Plato. reality. Reason, responsibility, respect, and realization. It, Plato had that. Plato had the three. Yeah. Aristotle and, had the five. And, and you don't see them too as just basically the same reflection of the same, coming out of the same mirror? Or no? well, well, so you can say that, just like you can say, well, men and women are both just examples of human being. Right? You can. I, it, it's yeah. completely it's completely legitimate, and there are important yeah. distinctions between men and women, between yeah. male and female, masculine and feminine, which are, um, which are important depending on what you want to deal with, right? So one of Ayn Rand's, so Ayn Rand is typically understood to be orange, right? This is what I'm suggesting, right? But Ayn Rand has a very well developed epistemology. Right? How do we know things? How do we use the mind? How does the mind create concepts? What are valid concepts versus in, invalid concepts? Right. She, has, she, she has a, a an epistemology called objectivism. Right. And the heart of her epistemology is that all knowledge is contextual. Right. All knowledge is contextual. In other words, she's a postmodernist. Right. Oh. Huh. Right. Uh, as here's here's one of my favorite examples. It's like, what is this? Uh huh. Right. So, what is this? A marker. It's a marker. Great. That's true. Okay. What else is it? We could say it's a cylinder. Right. Is that also true? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, w we can also say it's plastic. Right. Is that also true? It's true. Okay, now, if I were to say, um, I, it's also blue, right? Blue or blue white. white. I'm trying to, I'm, 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 I'm hopping to like, it's an instrument to achieve something. It's an instrument to achieve something. Is that, okay, now, here's the question. Is it plastic or is it an instrument to achieve something? Both. Oh, no, no. Is it one or the other? I'm telling you, it's plastic. <laughs> well, it's both. Okay. No, it's plastic. <coughs> you're you're fixated. That, that, that would be a silly argument to have, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. I suggest that most people's arguments in the real world are I say it's blue and the other person says no, I say it's plastic. I know, yeah. They, they think it's right wrong, where it's not right wrong, it's both and. Now, now can you knowledge is contextual. If you're looking at the shape, it's a cylinder. It is not a pyramid, it is not a cube. It is a right. cylinder. If you're looking at the shape, right. if you're looking at the color, it is blue. It is not green. Right. Right. If you're looking at the function, okay, it's a pen. It's an instrument to write. It's mm -hmm. a plug. You know, you can stick it in a dam. You can put it underneath a door as a doorstop. Yeah. But it, it is not a computer, right? Right. It's not a light bulb. So the it is not a rhododendron. Uh -huh. right? So knowledge is contextual. You have to look at the context. So is it which which is the right answer? Is it goodness, truth, and beauty, or is it reason? Uh, is it reality, reason, responsibility, respect, and realization? Yeah, it's yeah. just it's just a question. You know, now we're just dealing in semantics. Yeah, I. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. I want to bring up one thing, and then I I've got to wrap I've got to wrap up and go to the bathroom shortly. <laughs> uh, how does how does she deal? How does Anne Rand address um, death, or does she? The fact that we're going to be here and thriving and loving life, and that's what we should do, and yet one day we're not going to be doing it. Does she yeah. go there? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, she, I mean, she's she's an atheist. So she says that she says that from her perspective, she's not going to die. She's not going to die. From her perspective, the world is going to stop. The world is going to stop. Yeah, like she's having an experience, and then that experience is going to stop. Oh. <laughs> right. Do you believe that, or is that how you view it? I I believe that that the consciousness that I have now, the insights that I have now, the feelings I have now, are all a function of having a human body. Mm -hmm. When this human body dies, those functions will go away. What happens with consciousness? What happens with the rest of the universe? Um. If I were if I were a betting man and I am, right? Not that it'll matter when I'm dead, but um, <laughs> I would bet that the world is going to continue pretty much as it has, except without me. But my consciousness, the thing that I call Mark Michael Lewis, the self that I am, the caring that I have, the the joy that I'm taking with you in this conversation, right? I believe that the 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 instantiation of reality that makes all of that possible is this particular body. And when this body dies and deteriorates, that's going to go away. And there's no sense for remorse for that or fear or anxiety about what happens next. Well, uh, I, I will... I will miss it. I love this thing. I love life. Uh -huh. to, to not have it would be it will be tragic. Mm -hmm. um, but I won't be there to experience it. So in that sense, I don't feel anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> right? The the people that I care about, the projects that I care about, the the values that I care about, the values that I invest my life into every day because I think they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Without my tending, right? Without my like, I am a gardener. Without my tending the garden, the particular garden that only I can tend, because it's mine to tend, right? My particular set of values, my particular caring. Right. Without my caretaking, some of that will disintegrate. Right? Some of it will continue beyond me because it's a self replicating, evolving process. Like I have a conversation with you and it leads somewhere that goes beyond me. But some of the things aren't going; they're going to die when I die, and and I feel sorry for that. For the, I feel sorry for the world because I think that I'm creating some beautiful things, and I would love it. I would love to live a long time so that I can create more beauty, so that people can experience it. But while here, you have the opportunity to create a legacy. You create influence on people so that they can have a better life. Yeah, uh, and I find and I find that beautiful. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So in terms in terms of like me doing my thing and following my truth, I think that love and intimacy and caring and connection and the delight in ideas and people taking responsibility for themselves and creating real relationships with other people where they don't sell themselves out, where they really bring their real truth to someone else and they really see the truth of other people. And they're free to do that in a political context. I find that extraordinarily beautiful, and so I devote my whole consciousness to it every day. Um, I care about that, but I don't really care about a legacy. I mean, oh. I, I want I want to have an impact because I think it's beautiful, but you know, no one's going to remember me. Yeah, you, 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 I hear what you're saying. Is just do what you do; the legacy will take care of itself if yeah. it's concerned. 
Yeah, that, that that that's my particular thing on it, and and I I think that that's absolutely Iran's take on it. That's how she approached it when she spoke about it. If that's, I mean, if it matters, but that's yeah. my personal thing. Yeah, right. So I'm, bring bring your excellence to the world. You you didn't say what what other word were you using rather than excellence? Good, goodness. Yeah. Bring your bring your goodness to the world. Yeah, your virtue. Virtue, right. yeah, right. I, 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 Ayn Rand described, you know, virtue is that which leads to thriving. Virtue is the means to achieve values, and the ultimate value is in Ayn Rand's system. It's happiness. It's the appropriate creation of your life through work. Uh -huh. it's, it's to take responsibility for what you believe is possible, and then to work with reality as it is. To shape it into something that you find beautiful. Nathaniel Brandon, who wrote the book on self-esteem, who was a very close to Anne Rand, right, in some capacity, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, created this whole sentence stem uh, completion. And but what would she say philosophically? I know that that came out of her work. What would she say philosophically about? Somebody who was had low self-esteem or low self-respect. How? What would her? She would say, obviously, overcome it, right? Or or find it. Yeah. But how would she say how to do that? Well, so I don't look to Ayn Rand for psychological advice. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I, I, I thought maybe there was a pithy nugget. Well, that, well so, so so I think I think Nathaniel Brandon who had a much greater understanding of how human beings actually develop. Ayn Rand was really good at describing what a high-functioning human being is like. Right? Her heroes are all just extraordinary human beings. I mean, they're, uh -huh. they're truly admirable characters. Uh -huh. right? they're, they're never mean. They're never gratuitously mean. They'd, I mean, they're just great, great people. Characters. Characters, yeah. I mean, they're they're fictional characters, right? She used them to concretize her idea of an ideal human being. Right. Right. right? It's kind of like Herman Hesse and Siddhartha. Yes. Right. But I, but I mean, even 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 her philosophy, I of what I'm taking is is that have a strong character as a human being. Have character. Yeah. yeah. And 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 the way you do that is to deal with the reality of who you are. And if you have low self-esteem because you're not thinking, and you're not being you're not being fair to other people, and you're a parasite on other people's work, and you treat people disrespectfully, and you use power against them, and you tear down other people's achievements in order to make yourself feel better, if you do that, you should feel bad. Right. You should you should feel bad because that bad feeling is your intelligence's way of saying don't do that, <laughs> right? Deal oh. with confront reality. Use reason where you're not using reason. Of course, if you avoid thinking about something, if you avoid confronting the truth, you're going to feel bad, and you should feel bad. That's the nature of the human organism. Thank God. Right. So stop doing that. Yeah. Right? If you're not taking responsibility for yourself, yeah. if you're demanding that other people take responsibility for you, yeah. you're going to feel bad. Yeah. And, and should feel bad. And Brandon gives you the tools to do that. Yeah. And, and Ayn Rand says, try to be a hero. Confront yourself. Do what my heroes would do. Yes. Now, right? you, you, you brought up at the beginning that you're coming up with... What is it about Ayn Rand's heroes? So, 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 so I have two Ayn Rand projects. One is called Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero, right? Because I'm I'm an entrepreneur coach. I'm a personal coach. I'm a life coach. I help entrepreneurs create more profitable businesses and more profitable lives. Right? Better relationships, better happiness, better health, better communities, right? Better businesses. Right? I'm the profitability coach. That's my monitor. Moniker. Yeah. I help people create more profitable lives where 
their life gets better every day. Wow, beautiful right? that, word. That that's that's what I that's what I do for a living. <laughs> wow, right? I envy you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And and one way of putting that is, for people who are admirers of Ayn Rand and her books, because not everybody is, right? But for those who are, a way of thinking about that is to become an Ayn Rand hero. To to structure your life and your lifestyle so that it has the qualities of an Ayn Rand hero, right? So so that's the this. This uh, interview is part of the Becoming a Nine Rand Hero program, the show. And there's a subset of that called Integral Ayn Rand, <laughs> which is specifically about how to, you know, for people who are into integral, why is Ayn Rand important? And how can Ayn Rand help you become more integral, which I believe she can, and that most people would benefit by spending um, a a few hundred hours really investigating Ayn Rand's work, that it would make you much better at integral. That's my that, thesis. That's what's really landing for me, as you say that, Mark, is the uh, because of my integral thing. And Are you finding people in the integral community are lacking in this area? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Very few people have learned the injunctions and performed the injunctions of Ayn Rand, and so they're not... In, they're not a good community of the adequate, but they pretend that they are. They wow. cast they many people in the integral community cast judgment on on Ayn Rand without knowing what she thinks. Wow. And like, I find that extraordinarily unfortunate because the better you are at Ayn Rand, from my perspective, the more you will understand integral. Because you understand the pre-trans fallacy at a whole new level, you understand the three strands of valid knowledge, you understand why getting one level really, really good allows you to go to the next level, and how rationality is really the kingpin for integral. Yeah, I believe. Well, I'm... well the, the the big piece of that I really take away from her in our conversation is this kind of quality of of, of agency and adequacy and knowing yourself in a healthy way uh, because I, I experience and I experience this myself and also a lot of other people in the community is a kind of um, timidness uh, of not wanting to of you know that kind of that level of development of just this is who I am this is where I stand um, and that's my big takeaway with it is wanting to bring that to the table more and develop that and integrate that. So that, 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 that sounds really beautiful to me. Yeah, keep in touch with me about if this unfolds in some way with uh, a seminar or a practice or a community that builds around and ran integral development. Please let me know. You you got it. You see something like that possibly happening? Um, I intend to create it. Ah. Uh -huh. Right. So <laughs> so I I I am I am actively in the process of creating it. I think I think that um, if I succeed, it will be a self-replicating, <laughs> right, evolving process that goes far beyond me and leads to thousands and tens of thousands of people being involved. But right now it's. Yeah. It's it's inception. It's embryonic. Beautiful, Mark. Well, people, oh, you're you're, you're very <laughs> impressive. This was the best two hours I spent in the longest time. I truly, sincerely mean that. I I'm, I'm glad uh, we connected, and um, uh, we should find a way and a reason to get together again. I know that you're kind of launching something here. Let me know if I can be of help to you with anything like this again. I'm going to look at you as a profitability coach. I'm going to look at the work you're doing. Um, but, yeah, let's keep in the loop. What do you say? I like it. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate your, um, your willingness to go on the ride and go where the, you could say, where the logic leads you. Like you didn't have any agendas that really got in the way of anything. And, and I, it's one of the things I enjoy about really good integral peeps. Right. Yeah, yeah. Is, you know, 
they'll, they'll go on the ride and take what they like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm looking for my reason, how did the French say it? The raison d'etat, my reason to be. After all of my searching, I'm still looking for my reason to be. And I think you gave me a good piece today. With I really need to develop this part of myself, my my orange agency. So, with that, I'll give you a Buddhist bow. <laughs> Unless you feel that you have something to, you must say. No. I'll I'll just I'll say so how I like to say it is namaste. Uh-huh. No mistakes. New mistakes. Namaste, no mistakes, new mistakes. <laughs> it's and, been a pleasure, Michael. Yes, yes it really has. Uh, I'm glad to meet you, brother. Um I'm sure our paths will cross again. Keep me keep me in the loop with anything else that's going on. Or if I can help you in some way, if I can help you uh, role play this, or you're trying to tease out these ideas, you want to do some more video, let me know, man. Great. Thank you, sir. It, it, it has been a pleasure. Yeah, same here. I look, I, I look forward to hanging out with you through time. Good. Okay, brother. Bye. Be well.